Welcome to Aaron Menke's Cabinet of Curiosities, a production of iHeartRadio and Grim and Mild. Our world is full of the unexplainable. And if history is an open book, all of these amazing tales are right there on display, just waiting for us to explore. Welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosities. There are only three guarantees in life. Death, taxes, and farting. Okay, so that's not the original quote, but maybe it should be. Farting is a universal experience, after all. No matter how strong-willed or tight-cheeked we may be, everyone eventually faces the embarrassment of passing wind at an inopportune moment. And then there's the discomfort of resisting the urge to fart, not to mention the unpleasantness of being subjected to someone else's. When you stop to consider all of the problems created by humanity's flatulence, it's almost staggering, and it makes you think, someone should do something about this. That was the argument made in an essay written to the Royal Academy of Brussels in 1781. The author was an American amateur scientist and part-time inventor. While living abroad, he had become frustrated with the state of European academia, which he saw as overly concerned with impractical ideas and pretentious thought experiments. He thought that their time would be better spent focused on discoveries that could actually benefit humanity, like conducting research into the causes of flatulence. He wasn't sure exactly where such research would lead, but he reasoned that there was obvious benefits to understanding such a widespread issue. And by applying the scientific method, he hoped that millions of lives could be made more comfortable, pleasant, and significantly less stinky. Perhaps it would even lead to the invention of a drug that would render farts, and I quote, not only inoffensive, but agreeable as perfumes. We'll never know what the Royal Academy would have thought of this letter because they never received it. The essay was circulated amongst the author's friends, some of whom were scientists themselves, but it was never submitted. And that's too bad because it really was ahead of its time. You may not realize it, but these days we benefit from extensive research into this very field. Like one study completed in 1998, a pair of scientists willingly smelled the farts of 16 subjects who had been fed a diet of pinto beans. To make sure that they got a good strong whiff, they had the subjects wear gas-tight mylar pantaloons. After smelling the farts, they ranked them by intensity of their odor. And it's thanks to such experiments that we now know a great deal about the science of passing gas. For instance, we know that farts typically consist of nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, hydrogen, and methane. We know that they're created by bacteria in our colons, which feed on complex carbohydrates that our bodies aren't capable of digesting. And we know that the average person farts between 10 and 20 times a day, expelling enough gas to fill half of a 2-liter bottle of soda. And that is a lot of farts. But fortunately, 99% of it is odorless. The 1% that does stink gets its smell from sulfur, which is found in beans, onions, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, and dairy. And just like the essay's author predicted, we now have access to over-the-counter drugs that counteract farting. They work by breaking down complex carbs before they reach the large intestine. That said, over-reliance on these drugs isn't generally recommended, because we now know that farting is a good thing. It's a sign that our body is in balance. You could even say that it's healthy, at least for those who dealt it. And for the one that smelt it, farts are still gross and can even be dangerous. In rare cases, they've been known to spread disease like tonsillitis, scarlet fever, heart disease, and even flesh-eating bacteria. And this may also explain why we don't mind sniffing our own farts. It's not just an idiom, by the way. It's been conclusively proven through blind smell tests that we prefer the smell of our own farts to those of others. This is likely due to a combination of habit and practical evolution. We're subjected to our own gas so often that it would be problematic if we couldn't stand it ourselves. But it's still important that we avoid contact with others' farts as much as possible. So, hopefully, the essay's author would be impressed to know how much ground has been covered in this critical field. As far as we know, he didn't contribute any of his own research being caught up with other things, like conducting groundbreaking studies in electricity and contributing to the Declaration of Independence. That's right, the essay was written by the statesman, diplomat, U.S. founding father, and apparent fart enthusiast, Benjamin Franklin. (laughs) 
Bowling is a classic pastime. From leisure to competition, the sport appeals to all kinds of people. Just like the many things that we talk about on this show, when we peer a little further into the past, we can see that the history of bowling is not as straightforward as it might seem. The earliest evidence of bowling can be traced back to 5200 BC, with artifacts discovered in the tomb of an Egyptian child. These ancient relics tell the story of a game involving stone balls rolled at stone pins. A similar game was found in Polynesia, featuring stone balls and pins, reflecting the game's universal appeal across cultures. The next known evidence of bowling comes from ancient Germany, where the game took on a ritualistic role within religious ceremonies. In the 3rd or 4th century AD, parishioners in the cloisters of churches would roll a stone at a club known as a kegel, symbolizing the hide, or heathen. Toppling the hide was believed to cleanse one of sin. Over time, the clubs evolved into pins and the association endured, leading to bowlers being affectionately dubbed keglers. As centuries passed, the game evolved, with stones giving way to wooden balls and variations emerging, including games with 3 to 17 pins. Martin Luther, the 16th century cleric, is credited with standardizing nine pins as the ideal number. Luther even built a bowling lane for his children, where he occasionally joined in the game himself. Bowling eventually spread across Europe, Scandinavia, and eventually reached the United States. The earliest known reference to bowling in America dates back to about 1818 in Washington Irving's Rip Van Winkle. However, the game varied widely in rules and equipment across different regions, with the transition from nine pins to ten pins in America remaining a mystery. By the mid-19th century, bowling's popularity had soared, leading to the construction of indoor lanes in cities across America with large German populations, from Manhattan to Chicago. However, standardization was lacking until representatives from various regional clubs established the American Bowling Congress in 1895. This marked a pivotal moment, enabling national competitors and setting standards for equipment and rules. But despite its widespread appeal, bowling wasn't without controversy. Throughout history, various bans and restrictions have been passed. In 1366, for example, King Edward III of England outlawed bowling to prioritize archery practice among his troops. However, the ban was lifted by Henry VI in 1455, briefly revitalizing indoor bowling alleys in 15th century London. The pendulum of prohibition swung again in the 16th century, with Henry VIII restricting bowling to the wealthy albeit allowing commoners to indulge in the game on Christmas. Queen Mary further tightened the reins in 1555, outlawing Christmas games, including bowling, due to concerns about unlawful activities. In the United States, bowling faced its own challenges. In 1841, Connecticut law prohibited nine-pin lanes due to the association of bowling with gambling. Yet the ban underscored the sport's popularity evident in its presence even in the mansions of industry magnates. Despite these hurdles, though, bowling persisted and flourished. In 1917, the Women's International Bowling Congress was established in St. Louis, Missouri, providing a platform for women bowlers. And over time, bowling transcended its tumultuous history to become a beloved pastime, fostering camaraderie and competition among people of all ages and backgrounds. From its humble origins in religious ceremonies to its journey across continents and through legislative hurdles, bowling's story is one of resilience and adaptability. Today, it continues to roll on, a testament to its enduring appeal and the communities it has brought together. I hope you've enjoyed today's guided tour of the Cabinet of Curiosities. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or learn more about the show by visiting curiositiespodcast.com. This show was created by me, Aaron Mankey, in partnership with How Stuff Works. I make another award-winning show called Lore, which is a podcast, book series, and television show. And you can learn all about it over at theworldoflore.com. And until next time, stay curious.